Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our latest webcast, Around the World in 60 Minutes. Before I go any further, I'd like to make it clear that it's not my goal to be a pundit. Uh, I'm not going to tr make guesses about the future. I'm going to hopefully lay out a, a coherent story about how we've gotten to where we are, what the current state of the world is, and uh, what reasonable measures we might take to prepare for anything that might come next. But before moving on, I think it's important to address the question of why should we care? Why should we care to take a, a world tour, to take a tour of goings-on outside the United States? After all, there's plenty going on here. Um, you know, with a, with a new administration in its, I think, about 90th day, uh, there have been, it's been very eventful, very unusual. Uh, this has not been a normal first 90 days, a normal new administration. So it's been filled with many consequences and, and many unexpected twists and turns. Um, so why should we care to look beyond our borders at what's going on elsewhere, politically and economically? Well, to begin with, political, political and economic developments outside the U.S. still impact us here. It impacts us in one of two ways. If you're a global investor, as, as I think you should be, and we'll talk more about that later, um, your investments outside the U.S. are going to be impacted by those political and economic developments, and so you should care. Um, but even if you're not investing outside the U.S., we are living in a highly integrated, globalized world. You know, notwithstanding some of the populist backlashes against this whole concept of globalization, it's been going on a long time. And the, the world, including the United States, is very integrated. So events taking place beyond our shores, political and economic, have an impact here in the United States on both our economy, on our financial markets, and on your portfolio. So from that standpoint, you need to care. And of course, it goes without saying that what goes on here within the United States is going to impact your portfolio, but there's an extra dimension. It's also going to, political developments here are also going to impact the rest of your financial life uh, in, in ways, in far-reaching ways, including changes to your income taxes, your estate plans, potentially changes to Social Security benefits that you're either receiving or will receive in the future, Medicare and other benefits that either you or people you know may be benefiting from. Furthermore, half of the market is outside the United States, um, divided between the developed markets and the emerging markets. And so this is a reason also to be very cognizant of what's going on when you're dealing with half the world, or at least half the tradable world, outside your own border. And this is, as you can see from this chart, this is something that has, that has evolved over time that waxes and wanes. You know, back in 1990, the U.S., uh, only represented about 30% of the market, and, and uh, the developed international represented the, the other almost 70%. Um, and that's, you know, ris that's, that's waxed and waned and changed over time. Uh, notably, about a decade ago, um, the shift involved emerging markets starting to represent a much larger proportion of the, of the world market. Uh, currently, it's up to about 11% of the world stock market. We're also integrated in other ways through trillions of dollars worth of trade. This just shows the most recent number in, in February, but over the course of 2016, the United States exported $2.2 trillion worth of goods and services to overseas buyers. Uh, in that same year, we imported $2.7 trillion worth of goods and services, giving us a trade balance of about $500 billion. But even when you have an $18.5 trillion economy, a $2.5 trillion piece of that is nothing, is nothing to sneeze at. We are deeply integrated into the international trading system. And so that's another reason why we should care about what goes on outside our shore. And finally, if you want to be a truly diversified investor, the deepest pool, the deepest, uh, the, the biggest universe from which you can possibly choose to invest is the global stock market. You know, we're, we're, we can be very focused on a day-to-day -day basis on the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S&P 500, you know, with the former representing a mere 30 stocks and the latter 500 stocks representing U.S. companies only. If instead you look at the MSIC, MSCI All Country World Index, that represents fully 46 countries and almost 9,000 stocks. If you want to truly spread your risk, if you want to truly diversify, the global stock market gives you the deepest well from which you can you can draw that portfolio and, and, and diversify it. Um, there is no single 
there is no single approach that's more powerful for mitigating investment risk while, while capturing the upside potential than diversification. And so for that reason also, we want to be thinking globally. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to look at political developments around the world in the U.S. and outside the U.S. We're going to look at economic developments around the world. We're going to talk about which key factors to watch for in the coming days, weeks, and months. And then finally, we're going to talk about how you manage change in the midst of, you know, how you manage change and uncertainty um, through building resilience into your financial affairs and into your portfolio. So let's start with Europe. So in the Netherlands, we've already had an election. And the election sort of was, was the, the, the starting gun, if, it, if you will, for a series of elections that are going to take place this year that in some ways are an echo of what we saw in the U.S. last year. Um, the theme is a rise in populism, and it's a rise in populism that, that takes a certain form. It's anti-immigration. In many cases, it's anti-Islam. Uh, in, in many cases, it's also uh, those same parties are anti-European Union. This was the case in the Netherlands, where uh, Prime Minister Mark Rutte was up against Geert Wilders, whose party was far-right, anti-immigration, anti-European Union, anti-Islam, and was rising in the and was rising with this uh, populist tide and was rising in the in the polls and was was quite frankly worrying people who continue to care about European and especially Eurozone stability. Well, the election is over, and although uh, Prime Minister Rutte's um, party actually lost seats in the election, Geert Wilders' party did much worse, and so as a consequence. Um, the, the sort of reactionary far-right, anti-immigration, anti-EU forces uh, did not come into power. Now, the Netherlands is still going to be a little messy because the, the, it, the parliament is very fractured among a lot of smaller parties. They're going to have to form coalitions and probably a shifting array of coalitions. Um, but I think we can at least see that as, with respect to the European project, as it's often called, we could see that as... as uh, uh, I'm going to say a development that, that bodes well for further stability. Next up is France. Uh, we actually have an election coming up. The, the first round is coming up next week in which uh, a number of different candidates are coming forth, but the one that's getting the most attention is Marine Le Pen, um, who represents a far-right party that's also anti-immigrant uh, and to a significant degree anti-Islam and anti-EU, anti-European Union. Uh, she inherited, or I should say, seized control of a party that was controlled by her father for many years. Um, and at one time, the party was almost neo-Nazi and white supremacist. Uh, her father was actually convicted uh, of being a Holocaust denier, uh, which is actually a crime in France, as it is in Germany. So Marine Le Pen has tried to soften the image somewhat uh, while holding true to, to many of the, the sort of extreme anti-immigrant, anti-Islam, anti-EU kind of kind of uh, stance, and uh, her rise in the polls has caused people a great deal of worry. It's going to go to a second round, almost assuredly, uh, where she is expected to face Emmanuel Macron, who is uh, a former, a former uh, economic minister, and he's a sort of a 39-year-old who came out of nowhere. I mean, obviously he served in government before. He was he was uh, uh, you know worked as an economic minister, uh, but he is he was not very well known before starting a new party and really taking a, a huge run in the polls. And he's more centrist. He is pro EU. Um, he's he has a mix of conservative and and more progressive views, but fundamentally he is pro European Union. Uh, he is not anti immigration. He's much has a much more positive approach. Uh, a much more, uh, you know, a vision of a much more open and progressive France, um, and the expectation is if he faces Marine Le Pen in the in the second round in June, that he will prevail. But there is, in recent days, um, all of a sudden, a, a, a sort of a new player on the scene, Jean Luc Mélenchon, who is uh, represents a very far left party, um, has suddenly been rising in the polls as well, and it's it's you know it's not impossible that we could end up with an extreme right and an extreme left in the second and final round of, of voting. Um, Mélenchon is someone who is very much focused on workers' rights, and he he would like to to mandate by law a, a further reduction in the in the uh, work week to 32 hours a week, and, and and you know a number of other moves in that direction. Um, at the moment. 
the biggest, you know, the, the, the odds favor Marine Le Pen and Emmanuel Macron being the ones facing off and with Macron um, being the victor ultimately. And again, if this happens, this would be another vote for European stability. Uh, in Germany, Angela Merkel is now sort of fighting on two fronts. For a long time, her conservative party has been bleeding support to the Alternative for German Party, the AFD, which, is, again, is another far-right party, anti-immigration, anti-Islam, anti-European Union. Um, but now, all of a sudden, the, the Social Democrats, who are to her left, have been, have been rising rapidly in the polls. So she's sort of fighting on two fronts at this point. But nonetheless... Uh, she and her party are affected to prevail in the in the fall elections. Uh, uh, a lot can happen in the coming months, in the next six months. Uh, but for the moment, it looks like uh, Angela Merkel and her party will will remain in control. Again, that's another vote for stability and continuation in the and continuity uh, in the eurozone. Finally, in the United Kingdom, which had its big Brexit vote last year that we all know about, uh, Prime Minister Theresa May. In addition to invoking Article 50 last month, which actually triggers the two-year um, the two-year period of negotiation to negotiate the terms of, of the UK's separation from the, the European Union, she also, somewhat surprisingly to many people, called for elections. Um, strategically, those that that call was less surprising, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But she's likely to come out of this this upcoming election with an even larger majority in Parliament. So now let's talk briefly about Asia, starting with China. China is about China later this year will hold its 19th party congress. This is the 19th party congress since the, the communists took control of the country back in, in the 1940s. And at this congress, there'll be a, a, a significant turnover in membership of the Politburo, which is a much smaller group, which basically is, is the executive group that's charged with running things. Um, to, the, to date, the Politburo has been dominated by um, supporters of Xi Jinping's predecessor. This will be his opportunity to make a sweep with a big turnover to move his people in and, and, and to effectively uh, have, have significant, if not complete, control over the decision-making out of the Politburo. Um, there's some talk about perhaps to the degree that the, 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 the economic levers are still available to, to leaders of juicing up the economy to have a nice little boost of economic activity between now and then to put Xi in a better position to uh, get his people in and to get his his policies pushed through. Um, one of the things that China is finding is that while there was a time in the past when it was a much smaller economy, much more exclusively focused on export markets, and the, and the, the central government could exert a lot of control over economic activity, uh, that's becoming much less so. Now, as recently as the Great Recession, um, they were able to keep their economy growing through that um, by engaging in massive amounts of public investment, massive amounts of infrastructure investment. For If you've been paying attention over the years, you, you've probably read about trains to nowhere uh, and empty apartment and office buildings and airports that didn't serve any, that didn't serve any aircraft. Uh, and that's very true. You know, what, part of the way they kept the economy cranked up is by investing in massive new uh, high-speed rail lines and, and, and building new airports and building whole cities filled with apartment blocks and office blocks, um, but they were building to overcapacity. And so those become low-return investments. Now, in the U.S., where you have a situation where we have underinvested in infrastructure um, really to, a, to an egregious degree over the last 20, 30 years, um, for us, it would be high. It would be a high return investment if we could actually find ways to invest in the, the interstate highway system, in new rail lines, in new pipelines, in new ports, in new airports. These investments would actually be high return investments for us. They would actually shift the economy onto a higher growth path. And we can only hope that somehow some agreement emerges in Congress. Um, probably it, it will have to be in a bipartisan way to engage in those kinds of investments. But in China, they have, there's been so much overinvestment in infrastructure that those are now low return investments. And you see that already in the slowing of, of economic growth. Because those, when you overinvest, you actually get a low return, you get a low economic return. Anyway, to the degree that any of those levers uh, are still available to them, they're likely going to do what they can to juice up 
economic output between now and in the, the October November time frame when the when the Party Congress meets. It'll be interesting to see uh, how successful they are. Uh, one last thing I'll say about that is that the other thing that's happening in China is that it has been dramatically shifting more towards a consumer-driven economy than a pure export-driven economy. Uh, there's a very large and rapidly growing consumer class in the in the in China, and more and more of their of their output is being consumed domestically. And in fact, that consumer market is also becoming one of the biggest biggest export markets for many producers in the U.S. and Europe. So the more that, that China shifts to a consumer-driven economy, that also begins to limit the ways in which the government can directly control the economy. And it's very much the, tr the same way in, in the U.S. and in the rest of the developed world, including the, the European Union, um, where, where central authorities have only limited control over the economy, which is largely dominated by the consumer sector. South Korea has, has a snap presidential election coming up on, in May, on May 9, as a consequence of the, the uh, impeachment of President uh, Park kun hye um, That was a long, drawn-out uh, uh, drama that finally came to a head in recent weeks. And with uh, Park kun hye out, uh, the presidential election has been set for May 9. And th this is probably not going to be uh, very controversial. It, according to polls, it looks like the... The, uh, the person who was running against Park in the last election uh, is, the, is the sort of the lead candidate now and most likely to, to win the presidency. So this is probably not going to be something that's going to have a big impact on the Korean economy or the, or the world economy or your portfolio. Uh, finally, we have more saber rattling from North Korea. I don't know about you, but I, every time I read anything about North Korea, I feel, I, I feel like I'm, I'm reading about an insane asylum that's being run by the inmates. Um, and yet, interestingly, um, I'm not a student of North Korea, and when I listen to the people who have spent their lives studying it deeply, uh, they suggest that, in fact, um, the, the North Koreans are not insane, that the leadership is not insane, that what they're doing, although it might look that way to us, uh, at some point has a logic of its own and is rational for them. Um, fortunately, it seems like the U.S. and China may be on the verge of working more closely together in terms of reigning in the North. Um, certainly, China seems to have reached the end of its rope, and China should have influence. You know, I read the other day that um, most of the components for these, uh, these North Korean missiles that, that they're launching, including their attempt to, to develop uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, most of these components are coming from Chinese manufacturers, which means, presumably, that if China really wanted to crack down, they could be, exert some control over their own manufacturers and make sure that they're not shipping missile components to the north. Um, so we'll see how this unfolds. Uh, the, I don't think the U.S. is, is inclined to, to begin a war with North Korea. Um, at that point, they, they probably would become unpredictable if it was a question of preserving the regime, if it was an existential threat, as people like to say. Um, then all of a sudden, they might do something desperate. Uh, but for the moment, this looks like a noisy situation that is likely to move towards more of a of a, a diplomatic resolution so this but it's nonetheless something to watch so here's here are the things we think you need to be watching for in the immediate future if pro european if if candidates who are pro eu pro european union prevail in these up, upcoming contests in uh, in Fr especially in france and germany there may be there may be voting in Italy that's yet to be seen, but but we know there's going to be voting in France and Germany. If the if the pro EU candidates prevail, that'll be very positive for stability and continued growth in the eurozone. Even if the anti EU candidates prevail, um, you know any kind of a, a of a breakup of the European Union is is far from a you know far from a reality even at that point. Um, however, having said that, because there, there are just a lot of other institutional forces uh, that would put restraints on those leaders. We've seen the very same thing in the United States where some of the things that President Donald Trump attempted to do by presidential decree early on in his administration um, were thwarted by the courts. And some of the things he tried to do from a, from a, a uh, legislative standpoint were thwarted by Congress partly in, as, a, as a reaction to the feedback they were getting from their constituents. So there are other forces that can constrain new leaders, even if, even if they, have a very, they think they have a clear mandate. Um, however, 
Having said that, I think it's I think to the degree that sentiment is a big factor in what goes on in the market in the short run, markets are likely to be roiled. And so that would be a period of instability and a period of heightened volatility that we probably have to live through. Uh, the conservatives in the UK coming out of this, this, this new election are almost assuredly going to have a much bigger majority. And what that's going to do is, and, and this is really why I think Prime Minister Theresa May called for this election, with this larger majority, she's going to have much more leverage to, to conduct the Brexit negotiations the way she wants to. Right now, she's dealing with a very narrow majority. And a not insignificant minority of that majority uh, really wants, the, wants her to, I guess you could say, tear the Band-Aid off quickly. Uh, wants the, the Brexit negotiations to go quickly. Wants the separation, the severance between the UK and the European Union to be rapid and complete. Um, and this would be likely highly disruptive for the UK, uh, probably not good for the economy, certainly not good for the markets. And so I think it was actually a wise strategy of, of for the Prime Minister to call these elections, give herself the luxury of a larger majority so that she, she in a more comfortable way, can conduct these negotiations over the next two years and hopefully cut a good deal for the UK. So now let's talk about economic developments. So the European Central Bank... Um, following somewhat tardily what, uh, what the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank had done, uh, had begun quantitative easing. Um, and you may recall that, the, that there were three rounds of quantitative easing in the U.S. when the Federal Reserve went out and was buying bonds, buying treasury securities and buying mortgage-backed securities out in the bond market. Uh, and in so doing, they were, they were trying to push down intermediate to long-term interest rates. You know, they control short-term interest rates directly, but, but longer-term rates are set in the bond market by bond investors. Now, when a central bank decides to be a bond investor, they're the biggest bond investor. They're the elephant in the room. So they can actually move things around. Um, and the way that happens is that when you have a big buyer, like the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank, buying bonds, all other things being equal, they drive the price up through their buying process and their, their buying activity. And as the prices go up, the yield goes down. So by driving prices up through through buying activity, they cause interest they cause the yield and therefore interest rates in those intermediate and longer term maturities to fall. So the European Union, pardon me, the European Central Bank um, was not employing quantitative easing, but observing the effect in the United States, they finally began that themselves in order to try and kickstart growth. Uh, in the Eurozone. They had been buying for some time now 80 billion, 80 billion euros worth of bonds every month. So they're beginning to throttle down. As of this month, they're lowering their target from 80 billion a month to 60 billion a month. And I think you can expect that in coming months as if the European Union, if the European economies continue to show solid growth, I think you can expect to see them continue to ratchet that down further. So speaking of growth, this is, a, this is sort of a much overlooked story. The Eurozone economies have produced 14 consecutive quarters of growth. The unemployment rate in the region is back to single digits. The economic sentiment is the highest it's been in six years. And inflation rate has moved up to 2%. And I have to say, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. You know, those of us who lived through the 70s and early 80s and can remember that period of double-digit inflation, uh, you know, we think of inflation... We, it's very easy to think of inflation as a bad thing. And certainly, if we think back to that period in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, when inflation hit 13%, that is a bad thing. It's highly distorting in the economy. It's highly destructive. But a little bit of inflation is a good thing. And not only is a little bit of inflation a good thing, it kind of greases the works. But the opposite of that, if you actually slide into what's known as deflation, where prices are falling, that's a really bad thing. And you may recall that that's what central banks around the world, in Japan, the, the Eurozone, and, and here in the United States, were deeply concerned about back in the Great Recession, was that these, the major economies would slip into, into deflation. Because what happens is prices are actually falling. And so if you can imagine, if you could buy something, if you could buy that jacket or that washing machine or that car three months from now or six months from now with every expectation of paying less, well, you're not going to buy it today. You're going to wait. In fact, for as long as that's true, you're going to find every excuse in the world to keep putting those purchases off because every day, every month, every year that you put those purchases off, it's going to cost you less in real terms. 
And so all of a sudden you've got no demand in the economy and factories close and people lose their jobs and you, you end up with this vicious cycle of, of ever declining economic output. Whereas the opposite is true when there's a little bit of inflation. You know, if you're contemplating buying that jacket or buying that washing machine or buying that new car and you have every reason to believe that three months from now or six months from now or a year from now, it's going to cost you more. Well, there's no reason to, to defer that purpose, purchase. And in fact, there's every reason in the world to accelerate that purchase. And so it creates more demand, accelerating demand, You can create a, and it creates a sort of a virtuous cycle. And that's with a little bit of inflation, sort of greasing the works. Also creates a little bit of pricing power for companies so that if they if they run into problems with some of the the, uh, the costs of some of the inputs to their goods or services, um, they can they have the ability they have pricing power they have the ability to pass some of those costs along to consumers if there's a little bit of inflation. So that's why the Federal Reserve in the U.S. has been talking about wanting to have you know inflation of two and a half percent maybe two and a half between two and a half and three percent and the same thing has been true in Japan and in the eurozone. Well, they finally their wish has been coming true as it has here in the United States. So. Um, 14 consecutive quarters of growth, unemployment in single digits, high economic sentiment, and inflation hitting 2%. Um, and, the, and the actual growth rate last year was 1.7%. The economic growth rate, 1.7% for the, for the calendar year 2016 versus 1.6% for the U.S. Again, this is sort of an unsung story. It catches people by surprise. The Eurozone actually grew faster than the U.S. did last year. Eurozone stock markets, just year to date this year, they're up over 5%. Now, this has been true actually for several years that the, that the overseas stock markets have generally been rising, sort of in a reflection of what's going on in the real economy. As international, as global investors, we haven't always felt that because even though stock prices might be rising in local terms in Europe or the UK or elsewhere, um, if the dollar is rising relative to those currencies, it can actually offset those gains. We, we had a, a, an example of this a year and a half ago. Back in late 2015, the U.S. dollar took a huge run against almost every other major currency in the world, rising dramatically in value, almost unprecedented rise in value against all the other major currencies. So that even though there were positive gains in those markets, when you translate those gains back into dollar terms at the new exchange rate, it actually could diminish them or even wipe them out. Now, conditions in the U.S. with the Federal Reserve slowly inching up rates, as we'll talk more about in a few minutes, um, and, and other countries still being relatively accommodative with respect to interest rates and monetary policy, um, these are conditions that actually favor the dollar in terms of exchange rates. So. Our expectation is the dollar is probably going to remain relatively strong going forward, but we don't think it's going to get stronger. We don't think we're going to see another run like that. So that being the case, as long as the current exchange rate remains relatively stable, whatever those future returns are from overseas, we'll be able to translate those back into dollars and we'll be able to benefit from those. Now, in the long run, there's this economic concept called purchasing power parity. And a purchasing power parity says that the same the same good, the same product in two different markets after you've accounted for the exchange rate should cost the same thing, right? So if, in The Economist magazine, in a, in a somewhat humorous way, used to, used to measure purchasing power parity by using what they called the Big Mac index. Now, why did they use the Big Mac index? It's because McDonald's famously ensures that the Big Mac is absolutely identical in every market in which they in which they have stores. Every market. Um, many, many decades ago, I had a partner who was involved in an air cargo container company. And at one point he told me they're shipping iceberg lettuce from the Central Valley to Germany to the to the McDonald's chain. Well why was that? Well it was because they don't grow iceberg lettuce in Germany and McDonald's only makes the Big Mac with iceberg lettuce. So they were importing iceberg lettuce from the U.S., from the California Central Valley, so that that, that Big Mac could be identical. Anyway, I apologize for the divergence. But so, so if you look at purchasing power parity, the dollar is actually too expensive relative to other currencies. It, does, it doesn't make sense. Now, of course, we never have perfect parity. Currencies are always sort of on their way to... They're always on their way to equilibrium, but then they they pass they continue and pass by it. 
So currently the, the dollar is above equilibrium. At some point it will fall. It'll probably pass through equilibrium and then it'll rise again. We're always in motion. But if anything, the trends in the future are likely towards a, a falling dollar, which would actually be a, provide a boost. Uh, it'll actually supercharge returns from overseas markets. So now let's talk about political developments in the US. So uh, Obamacare has survived the first attempt to kill it. Uh, you know, as the old Monty Python line goes, uh, I'm not dead yet. Um, so it survived the first assault in the form of the, the uh, American Health Care Act, the AHCA, which sort of went down in flames. And we think the status quo is likely to, to remain for the foreseeable future. We actually think Ob Obamacare is probably going to be uh, what we're dealing with for a long time to come. And it's, you know, and we felt that way last year to some degree because, we, you know, we always, when, when the exchanges opened up, we continue to advise all clients to, if, you're, if you've got an exchange-based policy, you need to renew it. Um, but the, the, the death spirals that have been predicted are not really happening. There doesn't seem to be, there's, there's too much diversity of opinion among the Republicans in Congress to pass anything that, that, that uh, everyone can agree to. Um, and so as a consequence, we think the status quo will remain. It is possible that the government uh, could try and starve the exchanges. You know, right now, some of the exchanges are healthy and some are not. You know, Covered California is an incredibly healthy exchange. And California was behind it 100% from the beginning. There, there are a lot of carriers. It's a very healthy exchange. There are some other states where the exchanges are not so healthy, where it's down to one carrier, and they, and they depend on government subsidies. Uh, and, and elements of the law provided for the government to subsidize carriers to keep them in the exchanges. Now, there's some talk that, that the White House uh, or Congress could actually starve the, the exchanges of these subsidies, which could cause those carriers to drop out. Um, but that draw, that the you know health and human services department has has recently dropped that talk and said they're not going to do anything they're going to continue to, to to run the system as it has been run and previously designed and i think it's because they realized that um, they'd be blamed just as there was fears just as as the ahca failed because members of congress started hearing from their constituents and realized that if if they passed the law and 11 million people um, lost coverage, which is what the CBO, which is what the, the Congressional Budget Office uh, suggested would happen, that they were going to be blamed and they, and they realized that was going to be bad politics. Well, in the same way, I think the decision's been made that if they starve the weaker exchanges uh, and cause them to fail, they're going to be blamed for that too when people lose their, their coverage. So, so Obamacare, as it stands today, is, is not headed for death spiral. Uh, likely the status quo is going to continue for the foreseeable future. Which brings up next, tax reform. And this is so interesting because so many people have said, so, you know, many politicians have said, well, I wish we had started with tax reform and not tried to do health care because tax reform is easy. Uh, we don't think tax reform is easy. We think quite the opposite. We think it's going to be hard. And it's going to be hard for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons it's going to be hard is because tax reform, especially if it's tax reform where you want to lower rates, you have to pay for those lower rates somehow if you want to be revenue neutral. And the easiest way to pay for them, or the, in, in many cases the only way to pay for them, is to eliminate deductions. You know, what kind of deductions are we talking about? Well, it might be eliminating the, the home mortgage interest deduction. That's a very popular deduction. It might be uh, eliminating the charitable deduction. It might be eliminating the deduction for state income taxes. Well, every one of these deductions has a whole constituency of its own. So when you want to talk about lobbying, the lobbying that went on uh, to, when they were trying to pass health care, that was nothing compared to the lobbying that's going to go on when they try and reform, reform the tax system, especially if their reforms involve eliminating deductions. Um, you know, one of the things that also makes it harder, and one of the reasons they started, the Republicans started with health care, is because their proposed health care law was going to actually, was projected to save money um, by slashing Medicaid uh, reimbursements to the states. And so as a consequence, that was going to create a savings that could be used to offset any additional revenue loss from tax reform. Well, those savings are now not going to materialize. And so tax reform, it's much harder to make it revenue neutral. Again, you can do it by, by slashing deductions, and, uh, and, and that's going to be a battle unto itself. The question is also out there uh, about whether or not they're going to try and be comprehensive or choose to focus 
first on one first on one element and then another in terms of are they going to focus first on the corporate taxes and then the individual or vice versa? Um, you know, an argument could be made for focusing on corporate taxes. The top corporate tax rate in the U.S. today is 35 percent, which I believe is the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Uh, and it creates issues. It creates distortions. So there's a, many of the proposals have that rate coming down, that, that maximum rate coming down to 15 percent. And there are also proposals to have a much lower rate to encourage companies to repatriate uh, what I think is a couple of trillion dollars that are being held overseas. Uh, you re repatriate those dollars, even at a lower tax rate, you make additional tax revenue, uh, and you also bring those dollars home where they could be invested in, and potentially spur economic growth. So that's going to be another big question. Um, but at the same time, the Secretary of Treasury has recently said, uh, this is really not likely to happen before the August recess. So if it doesn't happen before the August recess, uh, I mean, it, it means it at the soonest, it doesn't happen until Congress comes back at the, in the fall, uh, and even then, they're going to have a full plate. So that'll be interesting to see if it happens this year at all, if anything happens, uh, if, or if it gets pushed off into next year. Obviously, if any aspect of this is going to be controversial, uh, congressmen or con you know Congress people are going to be uh, nervous about pushing into 2018 if there's any risk in the midterm elections. So this one's very much up in the air. Um, so a shift in corporate taxes could be a positive thing. Individual tax rates uh, depends on what comes out of, of the process. So this will be one to watch carefully. Social Security, you know, the trust fund, it's about $2.8 trillion right now. It's still projected to be gone about 2034, you know, depending on how fast the economy goes because that has an impact on tax revenues. You know, maybe it's a little sooner, maybe it's a little later. But plus or minus, sometime around 2034, the trust fund is gone. Now, that doesn't mean that benefits go away for current recipients. Um, what it means is, is that it becomes a pay-as-you-go system. And so it's the current taxes being collected that get passed directly onto the recipients. You know, it becomes a pure transfer system. And that, as a pure transfer system, it would support about 80% of the benefits being paid out today. So current recipients would see about a 20% reduction in their benefits if that happens. Also on the political front, there was a close call in Georgia yesterday um, when you had John, Democrat John Ossoff in a, suburban, in a suburban district just outside Atlanta almost made it, almost seized the, the, the seat in the House of Representatives on the first round. Uh, if he had managed to get 50% of the vote, he would, have, he would have won in the first round. He came close. He, the last number I saw was he got 48.1% uh, of the vote, so he came really close to, to seizing it in the first round. Didn't quite make it. So he will have another, he'll, he'll face uh, the Republican Karen Handel in, uh, in a runoff in June, and that'll be an interesting race to watch. This is a, you know, this is a county, or pardon me, this is a district that Mitt Romney won by 23%, and Donald Trump won by, I think, less than 2%, maybe not more than 1%. Um, and so that tells you a lot about this district, and, and John Ossoff's really good showing tells you more. So this is maybe, you know, something to be worrying uh, for, for congressional Republicans. Uh, it may be a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the 2018 midterms. So I want to just briefly do one more bit of, of summary on, on Social Security. Um, on the left, you have the Republican proposal that's been put forward by Representative Johnson. I actually talked about this in our last webinar. Um, he's talking about his proposal would increase the normal retirement age from 67 to 69. Now, this is very much along the lines of what happened back in 1983. Back in 1983, the, the Social Security Trust Fund was right on the cusp of failing, I think maybe even that very year, or, or being emptied, however you want to put it. Um, and so a, a special panel, a special bipartisan panel was put together to come up with a solution. Uh, and the solution they came up with, which was passed and signed into law, uh, solved the problem by taking what was then a normal retirement age of 65 and, and slowly increasing it to what it is today, age 67. And increasing the normal retirement age from 65 to 67 was enough to increase the solvency or to extend the solvency of the, of the trust fund another half century. From 1983 to, to 1934, uh, pardon me, to 2034. So it extended it by another half century. But nonetheless, that, you know, the, it, it, we're hitting another deadline looming in the future. Not quite as near as it was in 1983. 
So, so Representative Johnson's proposal is very much along those same lines, extending the normal retirement age from 67 now up to 69. Also of changing the way cost of living adjustments are calculated to use a, what's known as a chained CPI. The chained CPI um, is calculated differently than the, than the CPI W, which is the CPI for all urban wage earners, uh, and it results in a lower increase on average. The payroll taxes, the Social Security taxes, would be the same. Taxation of benefits would be phased out and completely eliminated. And his, his proposal um, is projected to fully cover the shortfall. At least, I, I say fully cover. I think, it's, I think it's projected to extend the solvency of the trust fund out to 2090 or thereabouts. Now, a new proposal has just come out. Representative Larson has, pardon me, yes, Representative Larson, no, let me say this right. Representative Higgins of New York has has revived a proposal uh, that was put out by Representative Larson uh, back in 2015. And that Democratic proposal would have left the normal retirement age at 67. Would it would have also changed the cost of living adjustment, but would have gone in the opposite direction. Would have changed to the C, from the CPIW to the CPIE, which is the cost of living for the elderly, which is higher than the cost of living for the population at large. So this would actually result in higher cost of living increases. Um, he would deal with financing, and at least in part, by changing payroll taxes. The basic payroll tax would stay the same. Uh, you know, currently you pay you pay Social Security taxes on the, uh, I think for, if, um, for individuals it's, uh, or for everyone, it's up to the first $127,000 of earned income, uh, and then it stops. Well, under, under the, the Larson-Higgins plan, um, it would still stop at 127000 or whatever that was adjusted for for inflation, but it was resume at incomes above 400, earned incomes above $400,000. Um, it would not completely eliminate the taxation of benefits, but would adjust them for inflation. Currently, if, you, if a, couple, a married couple has earnings, uh, has income above $32,000, it results in their Social Security taxes being, so, pardon me, their Social Security benefits being taxed. And that's the original number from when the law was passed many years ago. It's never been adjusted for inflation. So under this proposal, it would be increased for a married couple to $100,000. So only when you're in taxable income exceeded $100,000, which your Social Security benefits begin to be taxable. And that would also be adjusted for the CPI. Now, the sad truth is that this proposal has a lot of increases in benefits, and, um, and, it, has an, and it has an increase in, in taxes that's really inadequate to cover all of that. So it's hard to say where that's going to go. But the one thing we know for sure is that uh, President Trump has rejected, at the moment, has rejected any changes to Social Security and Medicare. Uh, the, you know, our understanding is that the White House, the people who put together the White House budget had actually put in changes to both Social Security and Medicare. And when President Trump saw that, he said, no, take that out. Uh, you know, I promised there weren't going to be any changes to Social Security and Medicare, and we're not going to do that. So without any support from the White House, this is, this is clearly back on the back burner. Um, and so this was just like an FYI uh, to let you know the current status. So now let's talk about what to watch for. Well, first of all, you need to watch for the budget extension next week. April 28th uh, is the deadline when, when uh, the, uh, the current budget uh, extension ex expires. The current budget authorization, I should say, expires. And if nothing is done, we could theoretically have another government shutdown. Uh, you know, I'm sure you remember that from a few years ago when the Tea Party, when the Tea Party Republicans actually did cause a government shutdown, and it was fairly chaotic. It didn't last very long because it was so chaotic. Um, you're not hearing about this so much because I think the, that the odd, everyone's assuming the odds are that it's not going to happen. That even if you had, um, you know, even if you had one faction of Republicans who was opposed to an extension. Um, that Democrats would probably reach across the aisle and, and, and support some kind of a continuing resolution, you know, budget resolution. However, the Democrats, they, they, they're drawing their line in the sand as well. And there are certain changes to social policy, including Planned Parenthood funding and a few other things. And they're saying if that's axed uh, from the budget, then we're not going to step across and step across the aisle and support this. So it will be interesting to see. There's going to be a lot of jockeying in the next week. Um, you know, odds are it's going to turn out to be a non-event, um, but it's going to be worth watching. Now, with respect to tax reform, which is the, you know, the next thing on the plate of Congress and the White House, um, any actions to reduce corporate taxes 
uh, would probably continue to buoy the markets, and that's one of the things that's one of the explanations that's been offered for how 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 buoyant the markets have been, is that uh, is that there's a, a real expectation of lower corporate tax rates, uh, which all other things being equal would be good for companies and good for stock valuations. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it's revenue neutral or temporary. You know, the, because they because they weren't able to raise to to save um, money through the the healthcare reform, um, it's going to be harder to make the the propose the tax reform proposals as revenue neutral as as the, re the congressional Republicans would like. And if they're not revenue neutral, um, they can't get by with 51 votes in the Senate. They the only way they can do that is if it's either revenue neutral or it's temporary. And you may recall that back during the, the, the uh, George W. Bush administration, we had all of these temporary measures, all of the tax measures that he passed, uh, including the reduction in income tax rates and the reduction in, in uh, estate tax rates or the, the increases in the estate tax thresholds, the credits. All of those things kept having sunset provisions that had to keep being extended. And the reason was, if it's temporary, you can pass it with a simple majority. You don't have to have a supermajority, and so, and so, if to be temporary means it has to sunset within ten years. So it'll be interesting to see if that's the path that they end up that they end up taking with with tax reform. Uh, in terms of border adjustment taxes, which are basically like import taxes, those would be fundamentally bad. They would be bad for um, the U.S. economy. They, you know, you don't want to lead to a trade war, and it's also bad for U.S. consumers. And it's, I'm going to say it's it's actually very regressive. Which means it doesn't really make sense if you think about uh, who who Donald Trump, who President Trump's primary supporters have been. You know, they were often individuals of modest means who felt left behind economically. Well, the thing about imports, you know, we may be a net importer, but and and we could say, well, the current account deficit is a bad thing, and to some degree it is, except for the fact that the U.S. more than any other country on the face of the earth can actually afford to run a current account deficit. Not least because we, are, we, you know, we we have our own sovereign currency, and we are actually the reserve currency for the rest of the world, which gives us lots of flexibility to do things when it comes to trade deficits that no one else on, in the world can get away with. But the imports, we only import because things the things we import cost less. That's why we import them. If you can get something of the same or better quality for less through an import, that's that's why that's what creates a market. And so if you d restrict imports by putting border adjustment taxes on it, um, what happens is you make imports more expensive for consumers. And you make them more expensive for many of the most vulnerable consumers. So this is one that it doesn't make sense from so many different standpoints. From a consumer standpoint, from the standpoint of, of uh, risking a trade war. And when it comes to manufacturing, it's it's not going to bring any more manufacturing jobs back to the U.S. The thing that people misunderstand too often is that the U.S. is the same manufacturing power it always was. And let me go back to an earlier example from early in the last century when the U.S. was one of the greatest agricultural producers in the world. You know what? The U.S. is still probably the greatest agricultural producer, the greatest agricultural exporter on the face of the earth. But we only employ one one hundredth as many people in the agricultural sector because of advances in technology. So we produce as much. We're still the big boy on the block. We just don't employ very many people in that sector. The same thing is true of manufacturing. We are still a manufacturing giant, a manufacturing power, and we always have been. The difference is, is that we don't employ a lot of people manufacturing. And so even to the degree companies have exported some manufacturing jobs, when they onshore those jobs, when they br or when they onshore that manufacturing, when they bring it back from China or, or Vietnam or anywhere else or Mexico, when they onshore those manufacturing, uh, uh, I don't want to say jobs, but when they, when they onshore that manufacturing, they don't create a lot of jobs, if any. It's because well, most of manufacturing is done through automation at this point. And so it's a really, it's a, it's a bad argument. It's bad policy. Um, we hope it doesn't emerge. Uh, but it'll be one more thing to watch. And finally, fiscal stimulus. You know, we talked earlier about the prospect of spending significant amount of money uh, on our on our national infrastructure. You know, rebuilding our, our interstate freeway system, um, and and rebuilding our, our high speed or building high speed rail and building new pipelines and and, and all of the rest of that. Those would be great investments. Um, I, I don't know if uh, if Congress and the White House are going to have the fortitude to push something like that through. 
you know, there's been talk about pushing through a trillion dollars worth of investment. Um, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Could be undermined by the Fed. One of the problems there is that the Federal Reserve, as they begin to, to, to start to, to scale down, reduce interest rates, uh, uh, you know, sort of, sort of take a more cautious monetary policy, they could actually offset the, the stimulative effect to the degree that infrastructure spending, uh, you know, fiscal stimulus stimulates the economy and stimulates job growth and all the rest. Um, you can have offsetting forces where if the Federal Reserve in a, is in a more restrictive mode and they're raising rates and they're shrinking the money supply, that can actually offset that stimulative effect. So we'll have to watch. That's another one to be watching closely. So now let's talk about economic developments in the U.S. So in the fourth quarter, the, our, our gross domestic product, our economy, grew at an annualized rate of 2.1%. The International Monetary Fund projects that the economy will grow at 2.3% for this year as a whole, 2.5% next year. Uh, and that's compared to the 1.6% that we experienced last year. You may recall that was the year that the, the Eurozone grew by 1.7%. The 12-month trailing inflation has hit 2.7%. Again, this is a good thing. We're in a nice range now. The Fed should be happy. You, you know, everyone should be happy. You know, where there's enough inflation to kind of, kind of, kind of grease the works, grease the skids, uh, going forward. Now, the Federal Reserve has raised the Fed funds rate, which is the rate at which uh, banks um, lend each other overnight reserves. Um, they've raised it a quarter of a percent. It's now one percent. They're projecting two more hikes this year uh, of a quarter percent each. Three next year and three in 2009, which would get them to their ultimate target of 3%. They, the Fed feels that that's a, that's a normal long-run range for short-term rates. Um, they're also talking about beginning to shrink their balance sheet. You know, we talked about quantitative easing, and, uh, you know, starting in back in 2008, uh, when they began this process, they, they bought bonds, they bought treasury bonds and, and mortgage-backed securities that ultimately totaled over, totaled over $4 trillion. That's what they're carrying on their books on their balance sheet is $4 trillion, I think it's $4.2 trillion uh, worth of bonds. Uh, and so two things have been happening. The Fed stopped buying more bonds some time ago. But what they've been doing in order to maintain a more or less neutral stance is as those bonds mature, you know, when a bond matures, you get all your cash back. So as those bonds mature, they've been rolling them over, just like rolling over a CD. The bond matures, the cash shows up and is immediately rolled into another bond. So They've, they've maintained exactly, you see, in fact, in this chart, how the line, since the middle of 2014, the line has been flat. They've just been maintaining. Now, they can do one of two things to begin to shrink their balance sheet. One, they can simply just stop rolling them over. So if as these bonds mature, that are, in their, you know, that are on the books, as they mature, if they simply don't roll them over, then their stock of bonds begins to shrink. That would be a very slow process, but it would be one that would, that would reduce their inventory uh, reduce their balance, shrink their balance sheet very slowly. Obviously, they can also choose to be active sellers in the market. Now you get into a situation where, as an active seller, you get the opposite effect of when they were an active buyer, depending on the, the, the actual volumes. If the Fed starts selling bonds, well, all other things being equal, if they're selling a lot of bonds, they drive the prices down. When the price of a bond goes down, the yield goes up. And as the yield goes up, interest rates go up. So that's a case where not only are they, they slowly raising interest rates at the short end, uh, if they stop rolling the bonds over, there'll be a little bit of, a, of an upward, that will create a little bit of upward pressure. And if they actually start becoming active buyers, they want to more rapidly shrink their, their balance sheet, uh, then they might actually more more actively drive interest rates up. So again, that's one to watch. So I want to share some key numbers with you. Um, 26, 13, 18, 16, and 12. What the heck could those possibly mean? They actually are all related to each other. Uh, 26 is the current price to earnings ratio of the uh, S&P 500. So the S&P 500 is is uh, you know a measure of 500 blue chip stocks here in the U.S. Its average long run price to earnings ratio. So this is a measure of how expensive stocks are. A high price to earnings ratio suggests that stocks are more expensive. A low price to earnings ratio su suggests that they're less expensive. <clears throat> well, the long run average is about 15. So you've been seeing in the news you know, lately uh, on TV and in the newspapers and the magazines. People talking about the fact that it's above average, it's well above average, maybe this is something to worry about. Well, 18 
That's the price to earnings ratio of the all country world index, the MSCI all country world index. Now it's obviously much lower. And it's much lower because that's reflective of the fact, first of all, the all country world index includes the US. So this encompasses the higher price to earnings ratios that we see here in the US. But it's much lower because market valuations outside the US are much lower than they are here. For example, in Europe, the, the average, the European market as a whole, the average price to earnings ratio is running about 13. Emerging markets are running about 12. Uh, I threw the, 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 the aggregate price to earnings ratio of the Yeski Bui core portfolio in here. Uh, and, and this is quite low as well. And the reason for this is a combination of two things. You know, about half our portfolios are invested in the U.S. and about half outside the U.S. So this is partly reflective of the fact that half of our portfolios are outside the U.S. where valuations are much lower. Um, and, and it's also reflective of the fact that we significantly overweight um, value stocks. And value stocks are those stocks that are trading at low price to earnings ratios. They're trading at low prices relative to their earnings or their assets. So now let's talk about how you build resilience. You know, first of all, when it comes to your portfolio, you build resilience um, by recognizing um, where valuations are attractive. Now, market valuations in the U.S. are on the high side; they're not as attractive um, as they as they might have been, as they have been. Um, but I, we don't want to suggest uh, a mass exodus from U.S. markets. Uh, and in fact, I always like to temper uh, you know arguments about how expensive the U.S. market is. By, by, by pointing out that price to earnings ratios don't exist in a vacuum. You know, they are a product of the larger economic environment. You know, that long run average of 15 is the product of, of years in which it was much lower than 15 and years like this one where it's higher than 15. And so um, when you think back, say, to the late 80s and the early, pardon me, the late 60s, late 70s and early 80s that we were talking about earlier when inflation rates and interest rates were double digit, when inflation rates were 13% and you had 19% mortgages, well in that environment the price to earnings ratio was in the, here in the US was about 7. Um, and so in an environment where, where inflation and interest rates are in low single digits rather than high double digits, well it's not surprising that that would support a higher price to earnings ratio. The other thing that's worth noting is that corporate earnings growth justifies higher valuations. Because the current valuation that we've been talking about is backward looking. It's the trailing 12 month uh, value. It's, it's based on the trailing 12 months earnings. On a forward looking basis, companies are expecting rising earnings. And in fact, uh, even with the most recent uh, earnings reports that have been coming out in recent days, uh, especially from banks and other financial firms, their earnings have risen by 40 to 80 percent. So there's a lot of potential for rising earnings that would make these, these valuations look much more attractive than they are. Having said that, we think it's important to focus on value stocks, to focus on that stock, those stocks that are trading at low prices relative to their earnings or assets, at low price to earnings ratios or low price to book ratios, because there's much less downside potential and much more upside potential when you do that. Likewise, focusing on non-US markets, which are sporting attractive valuations, such as they are now, uh, uh, in Japan, in the UK, in the Eurozone, that offers much more upside potential and less downside potential. You want to be buying in markets when they're valued low. Uh, you know, you don't want to be buying when they're valued high. I'm not saying you want to flee those markets, as, we, as I just noted. Uh, but this is a great time to be an overseas investor uh, for, for all the reasons that we've talked about. Now, I, I have to add the caveat that if U.S. blue chips you know, take a fall, if the S&P 500 tumbles, if the Dow Jones Industrial Average tumbles, if you know major blue chip stocks in this market take a plunge, everything takes a plunge. That's just the markets are so interconnected that in the short run, you know, there's a big plunge today in the U.S. There's going to be a plunge tomorrow around the world. That's a fact. However, true value, true value will out in the long run. And so, if you can survive a little bit of that short-term volatility, a little bit about that short-term roller coaster, if you position your portfolio to be primarily exposed to lower to stocks with lower valuations, either because you focused on value stocks or because you focused on, on markets that are sporting lower valuations, you're going to be in a position to, to benefit much, much more from the upside potential when it begins to manifest itself. Finally, with the Federal Reserve moving quite steadily to raise the federal funds rate you know, heading steadily over the next two years to the 3% target, and also to shrink its balance sheet, um, you know, those, 
we think the Fed's going to be very measured, and we think they're going to be continue to be very pragmatic. They might even pause in, in, in either of those processes if they see that the stock market or the economy has hit an air pocket. But nonetheless, all of the things being equal, we think they're going to be committed to raising those rates and to, and to shrinking their balance sheet, which means probably raising longer-term rates as well. Um, and as measured as they're going to be, the fact is, is that rates are going to rise. And we think that means you need to keep your bond maturity short, keep your powder dry, as it were. Now, you'll, you'll benefit from those rising, those slowly rising rates. You know, your money market fund uh, rates, which are currently a small fraction of 1%, those are going to begin to rise as short-term rates continue to rise. Those will eventually be reflected in your money market yields. If you're invested in a portfolio of short-term bonds, well, be, by, by definition, short-term bonds mature frequently and they turn over. And so as they get reinvested, if rates are rising, they get reinvested at ever higher rates. And so those portfolios of short-term bonds will also start to experience rising yields. Now, at some point down the road, when the... Uh, you know, when, when interest rates are at what I'm going to put, you can't see the air quotes I'm putting it up, but are around more normal levels. You know, when short-term rates are more like 3%, when intermediate-term rates are more like 4, .5, 4 to 4.5%, that's probably a time when we can stretch maturities, when we could be investing again in intermediate-term bonds. But right now is a time to be short. So beyond building resilience, there's one other way to build resilience that we think is really important, and that's to build personal resilience physical, psychological, mental resilience. And the best way to do that is to unplug once in a while, put down your newspaper, turn off the TV, turn away from your computer, sit down, close your eyes, and just breathe. Um, because so many of the things that we've been talking about, so many of the things that we'll be watching unfold, if you've built resilience into your financial affairs, they don't require action on your part. But it's hard not to react. You know, we're sort of evolved to react to what's going on around us. And if we just build some personal resilience and become less reactive, we just become that much more effective. So thank you very much for your indulgence. I know I've gone over a few minutes. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was informative. Um, no one has posed questions uh, during this session, but I want to tell you, you should feel free to reach out to us offline. Um, email us, call us up, make an office appointment. Uh, if you have any questions, any comments, want to talk more about any of this stuff or how it affects you, we'd love to hear from you. And so, uh, again, thank you very much.